the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the communion, the community of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Even though the rules are we cannot uh, sing uh, as members of, of the congregation, you can speak. So I encourage you, while mass, to join in all of the spoken and unison parts of our worship together today. Let's join in the call to worship. God of grace, we gather today from many different places. God of grace, we gather today for many different reasons. May we open ourselves to you today. Our opening hymn, uh, number 490, God of Grace and God of Glory. Those of you uh, on the radio, listening on radio and streaming online, we hope you join in in the singing. And the rest of us, we hope you join in on the music. You can move, you can sway. You're Presbyterian. You don't like to dance most of the time, but feel free to dance gently. Uh, I invite you, please, to stand, and uh, we'll enjoy our opening hymn together. Let us pray. Creator God, you display your glory in your world through the majestic beauty of the changing seasons. Today we gather to celebrate another change of seasons. We invite the Spirit to bless us in this time of worship. Be our words, be in our praise, be in our song and our prayers, and be in our quiet. O triune God, our hope and salvation, we pour out our hearts in praise and thanksgiving to you as we pray our family prayer as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Friends, God's love is for you. You are forgiven people. Thanks be to God. Go now and live out God's light and love in our world. Every day of 
We are very, very fortunate today to welcome Elspeth Ford, future award-winning interviewer <laughs> extraordinaire. Brooke, yes. were you nervous for your first interview at Knox? Yes. But as the interview went on, I relaxed because people relaxed and, and we felt that we were making connections, that this was a place where good ministry could happen. Linda, yes. when you graduated from seminary, how many other female leaders were there in the Presbyterian Church in Canada? So when I graduated in 1979, Probably within the three hands, there was maybe 12, 13 um, that were ordained ministers. What achievements are you really proud of? I'm proud of all of the young people that we've been able to watch from when they were really little and they got older and add, see the neat things they're doing to make this world a better place. I think I'm excited about the community that we've created together here the way that so many people are involved in all different aspects and sharing you know what they're good at and their gifts and sharing it here in the church can you each share one of your funny Knox memories it was one of our first communion services and at one point I said something like the peace of Christ be with you and I went like that and the sleeve cut the bread that was in the tray and the bread went flying all over the place <laughs> My memory was also <laughs> communion. Oh. And also involved Linda. Oh no. She took the top off the Tray. communion wine. Mm -hmm. And at the top of the top, there's a big cross. And she put it on my <laughs> chair. <laughs> and we went through the communion service, and then it was time to sit down. Yep. And if you look at one of the communion trays, <laughs> it's just slightly bent. <laughs> What do you miss most about the old Knox building? I understand why our windows in this new church are the way they are. For the reason of transparency that we look out and we see the world. The world can look in and see us. I like the fact that we don't have stained glass windows. But I used to love, 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 love to during worship to look out through those golden windows. And it was like you could sort of see shadows. I could see a branch of a tree. I could see birds hopping. I looked out that same window and I had some of the same thoughts, but for three Sundays in a row there was one very spiritual squirrel I remember who was that on the too. bush right above the window, <laughs> listening attentively to the whole worship service and I thought, that's one special squirrel. Can you share with us any of your retirement plans? My first goal is to open up my date book at some point and find nothing in it. I just really believe um, once I rest and um, be open that um, I'll have a sense of what God wants us to do next. Brooke, if you could go on vacation right now, where would you go? I thought I that because Linda has a degree in Florentine Italian art before she became a minister. True story. And because I love Italian food that we would travel to Italy. <laughs> Where did you go on your first date? I remember. <laughs> cricket, cricket. <laughs> Was it a movie? No. <laughs> Was it a coffee house? No. He just lost that. What did I do? I considered our first date when you called me and you invited me to go for the last drive for yes, in, my, in my little because when I got drive. off the phone I yeah. went up to my mother and I said if a boy from church invites you to go on the last drive with him in a very special sports car is that considered a date and she said oh yes has anything embarrassing happened to you in front of the congregation when our middle daughter Emily was quite small so she came up when I was doing the children's story and she lifted my gown up and she went underneath and hid underneath and what I didn't know was 
did she also lift my dress up with it or not? So I turned around to the choir and I said, I don't know what you all just saw, but nobody's going to ever tell me, right? At baptisms, do babies cry more for Brooke or Linda? <laughs> we are overdue for a screamer. We have never had a screamer in 30 years and that's hundreds true. and hundreds of baptisms, and that's a little scary. What will you miss most about your work as a minister? Greeting people at the door on Sunday mornings. They have some hope in their eyes that something good is going to happen because they're in worship. It's a real privilege when people tell me their stories. They share something, um, not, I mean, they're sharing it with me. I get to hear their story, but I know that they're sharing it because I'm their minister. What do you wish you knew before that you know now? How to kind of do more boundaries and look after myself a bit better in terms of, you know, making sure certain things happen. Having the confidence to make mistakes. Yeah and learn from them is yeah. one of the best ways to learn. What are some of Knox's greatest strengths? People, mm -hmm. always people, caring people, compassionate people, generous people, people who want to make this world a better place for everybody. I really like the fact that they're open to keep changing, to hear the spirit moving them and challenging them of what else do we have to do? Where else do we need to grow? To never say, okay, that's enough now. What is your hope for Knox? To keep faithful, keep looking forward, and uh, be the community that God needs us to be in this city that we love. I really hope they keep, as a congregation, a lively community of faith, that they keep looking beyond these walls, that they care about the community and the world, but they keep being uh, challenging themselves and, and strive to do more in terms of um, growing and challenging and um, sharing that good news of Jesus in all kinds of new creative ways. my name to the long list of people who aspire to be interviewed by Elspeth. Thank you. Thank you for that. Welcome to all of you to today's service of worship and this time of celebration. This is the largest crowd we've had in the sanctuary in a very long time, and it is indeed a joy for us to be together. Whether you're here in person, whether you are streaming online, or tuning in via CK, uh, CKWR 98.5 radio, uh, know that you are welcome to this time during which we share space together. It's good for us to gather today. In case you hadn't noticed, today we are celebrating the ministry uh, of Brooke and Linda Ashfield on this, the occasion of their retirement. They are here in person with members of their family. Welcome to you. Uh, after the service, we will continue a celebration with, uh, with a special program, which I promise will be very enjoyable and very meaningful. We are all tremendously grateful for the work of the Celebration Committee, who's worked so ha hard to plan and then have to replan this event. The committee was led by Heather Cossey and Don Charlton, and they, the, the group included the energy and beautiful creativity of so many other people. Now, while those listening in on the radio won't be able to enjoy the festivities, which will begin around 11 o'clock, we hope that the live streaming community can, can stay tuned in to enjoy. Uh, and the worship, of, the worship service itself, this hour, is also a kind of tribute to the Ashfields as well. Uh, the hymns today, which we sing, were sung during their ordination service. Uh, and the five additional church leaders who have and will participate in the service are people whose ministries have been blessed through their association with Brooke and Linda. Uh, John Peter and Tori Smith have been dear friends of the Ashfields for many years. Uh, Tori is a diaconal minister serving within the PCC and she serves as the regional, she's the regional minister for faith formation for the Synod of Central Northeastern Ontario and Bermuda. 
And John Peter is also a Synod worker. His title is the Congregational Development Consultant for the Synod. Welcome to both of you. I can't see you behind all those beautiful flowers, Tori, but I know you're there. Uh, Michelle Butterfield Cochis is also present. Uh, Michelle uh, Shelley, as, as she's known by many, is the minister of, of Caradoc Presbyterian Church. And she, along with two others who will appear on video, Mike Burns, minister of Burns Mosa, and Reuben St. Louis, minister of Nasagawea Presbyterian Church, were connected with the Ashfields as ministry students, and, and some of them grew up in this church as well. They were mentored in many ways by Brooke and by Linda. Uh, we extend a deep word of gratitude to the three of you for being present, and to Mike and Reuben for participating from a distance. And gosh, also blessed by Elspeth Ford's interviewing prowess, uh, and by music which will be presented by MC, uh, and MC Pisano and Allison McHardy. Thank you to all of you who have contributed and will contribute to the celebration today. We received one bit of correspondence, and where did I put it? Oh, here it is. Which the committee asked for me to read during this part of, of our time together today. Uh, it's a letter from the moderator of the Presbytery of Waterloo and Wellington, dated September the 22nd. Uh, Dear Reverends Linda and Brooke Ashfield, on behalf of the Presbytery of Waterloo, Wellington, I thank you for your years of service, not only at Knox Presbyterian Church, Waterloo, but also for your service to the Presbytery. I will not try to recount the numerous official roles you have held in the Presbytery as committee chairs, moderators of presbytery, interim moderators, and the like. It has been in your wisdom and guidance, both on the floor of presbytery and in your advice to presbyters who consulted you, that your service has been especially valuable, frequently unseen, but of profound significance. On behalf of the Presbytery of Waterloo, Wellington, I wish you a fulfilling retirement in which you will know the love of Jesus Christ, the guidance of the Holy Spirit, and the peace, the peace that comes from resting in God. Yours in Christ, signed Peter Bush, the moderator of the Presbytery of Waterloo and Wellington. A couple of other announcements. Uh, I'm, I'm away for the next few days, enjoying a bit of vacation, and next Sunday service will be led by the Reverend Mark Gedke. Next Sunday is also Worldwide Communion Sunday, so Mark will be leading in communion. If you plan to worship via radio or live stream, then you can get some bread and some drink ready for the service. If you plan to attend in person, you can BYOC, you can bring your own communion. Uh, but if you happen to arrive and realize you've forgotten, or you can just plan to do this if you wish, we actually have purchased some commercial, individually packaged communion sets. Yes, these things exist, and we have some at Knox. There's one tab, you just pull it off, and there's a little piece of wafer, and then you pull the second tab, and there is communion. These will be available next week for you if you forget to BYOC. Uh, Thanksgiving is just two weeks away, and I'm collecting some gratitude photos. I want to find out what you are thankful for, and if that's something that can be captured on a camera, take a picture of it, send it to me, hugh at knoxwaterloo.ca, and put gratitude photo on the subject line, and I'd like to share some of the things for which you are grateful as part of the Sunday, Sunday service in two weeks' time. It is a joy for us to gather as we do today. It is a joy for us to receive so many blessings. It is a joy for us to give as we are able. God's blessings come to us on their way to someone else and somewhere else. Let's take a moment and ponder the many ways we receive gifts and give gifts. trees of green red roses too I see them bloom for me and you I 
and kindness is the air we breathe. In the spirit of Christ we pray, amen. Please be seated. Reading from the Gospel according to John. Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. 
Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming towards him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a little boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many people? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told the disciples, Gather up the fragments left over, so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up. And from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled twelve baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, This is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. This is the witness of the early church. Thanks be to God. We'll sing our hymn of the month. Spirit comes to us on her way to someone else. During those moments when we recognize the presence of the Spirit of God at work in our midst, we are catching but one small glimpse of the grand movement of the Spirit. We are most easily made mindful of that part of the story of the Spirit which touches our lives, but what we sometimes forget is that the Spirit had a story before she came to us. That Spirit touched the life of another and came to us through the other. And likewise, that Spirit, after entering our lives, does not become something we can possess or contain or limit, but rather the Spirit passes through us to continue on to someone else catching us up in a story that is far grander than any single one of us. The Spirit affects transformation in us and then uses us to be the hands and feet and heart of Christ as we, with the Spirit, touch the life of another. The Spirit comes to us on her way to someone else. The Spirit passed through the boy who offered his lunch to be shared, and a multitude was filled. The Spirit passed through the Gerasene who was healed by Jesus, and the man, it reads, proclaimed throughout the city how much God had done for him. The Spirit passed through Zacchaeus, who was so moved by this radical new way of living offered by Jesus that he gave his wealth away to those who needed it most. The Spirit passed through the woman who met Jesus at the well 
and she could not help but share the good news with everyone in town. There are countless biblical stories like this, stories which mirror our own experience. Your life very often is transformed because someone else's life was transformed and that transformation had an impact on you, perhaps through a word, an action, a kindness, a gift, a friendship. But that's not the end of the spirit story. Although our tendency is not to be as mindful of the next part of the spirit story, the reality is that the transformation which results in your life will touch the lives of others around you. The spirit comes to you on her way to someone else. The stories that you are going to hear now are stories of people whose lives have been touched by the Spirit of God as she came to them through the ministry and friendship of Linda and Brooke Ashfield. Yes, the stories you're going to hear happen to be from church leaders, but I know that there are countless stories countless stories, all of you could tell, of the same type of spirit movement. May what you hear today help you to reflect on your own stories of grace. Grace come to you and grace passing through you to someone else. There are many, many stories here. Stories of the spirit coming, spirit, uh, stories of the spirit touching another through you. Shelly. Oh, sorry, it's Reuben first and then Shelly. Sorry about that. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Reuben San Louis, and I'm the minister at Nasagawea Presbyterian Church. But also, uh, I was a member at Knox Waterloo and a student in seminary when I was there. And I owe much to Knox and particularly Brooke and Linda for helping to shape me into the minister that I am today. I remember many conversations with them about ministry, about my call, uh, about the church. But one of the lasting things that they imparted to me, which I now use in my own ministry, is the way that they approached baptism. Now, obviously, if you've seen a baptism at Knox, uh, Linda will begin by inviting the kids forward to the front, and then she'll start to explain to them what baptism is all about. Then uh, Brooke will say a prayer while he pours the water and, and the water will last just long enough or the prayer will last just long enough so that they end at the same time. I still haven't figured out how to do that properly yet. And then after the baptism, Linda will uh, introduce the, the baby, the new uh, member in the family of God around the congregation. It's, it's a wonderful celebration of God's Spirit coming to each of us in baptism. Now, I use all these elements in the baptism at my church, but the thing, the thing that has made the most impact on my own family and on the families that I serve at Nasagawea is the gift that Brooke and Linda would give to each family. Linda will get one of the kids to present a baptism candle uh, to the parents, and she'll invite them to light the candle on the anniversary of their child's baptism. Now, this presentation would always come with a little explanation of how Brooke and Linda's family would mark baptisms with a special meal, having friends over, looking at uh, old pictures from that day. And I, I love this part of the service because it brings faith home, where it can be nurtured, and passed on. And it's because of their tradition that they shared with us that my own kids remember the dates of their baptisms. It's why on February 28th and May 12th that we always have pancakes for dinner. And it's why we always remember the Olympic gold medal hockey game in 2010, because one of the pictures that we always look through on that day is one of Ben in front of the TV screen. Baptism Day is an annual tradition where we remind our kids that they are part of 
the family of God, gifted with the Holy Spirit. And now I pass on this spiritual practice to the families that I serve, equipping parents to fulfill their vows that they take to nurture the faith of their child and to welcome God's spirit into their home. So I wanted to say thank you, Brooke and Linda, for sharing your gifts with my family and through me to the families at Nassagawea Presbyterian. Truly, the Spirit of God came to you on its way to us, on its way to someone else. Blessings. Hi, everyone. So as you all know, and some of you may not, but I grew up here. This is my home. My first encounter with Brooke and Linda Ashfield was as a member of the search committee. I'm not sure if you remember that. <laughs> I was the youth representative. And as a teen, I remember questioning, what was a clergy couple anyway? <laughs> and how did that work? The adults may have had the same question in the room, but honestly, it was a fleeting question for me because all I really cared about was a minister or ministers who took the fervor of faith seriously that we, the youth of Knox, had at the time. And there's a few of us sitting here today, too, they can attest to that. I have to tell you, I sat mesmerized in the interview, and I am not being overly dramatic. <laughs> I was mesmerized. I was ready to hire them right on the spot. They smiled a lot. They smiled a lot. And they laughed during the interview. <laughs> and they looked pretty fun to me. <laughs> well, as we all know, Brooke and Linda Ashfield are fun. <laughs> and in the last years, I have come to the, know them not only as my fun ministers from adolescence and young adulthood, but as mentors and friends. When I share with people what growing into faith at Knox was like, people say to me, wow, you grew up in a really progressive church. Yes, I did. And my teachers formed me into a well-rounded woman of faith and minister. I had no idea as a teen that Brooke and Linda would become two of my most respected mentors, colleagues, and longtime friends. So then I entered ministry. And these nuggets of wisdom in all kinds of different forms start to come out of me from time to time. And as I share with colleagues or Bible study groups and even in sermons, and I think to myself, where'd that come from? And but seconds later, uh, Brooke or Linda, they kind of mesh together for me. I'm sorry, guys. For me, it kind of feels like a Jeff Foxworthy joke. You might be a redneck if. You might be a mentee of Brooke and Linda Ashfield's if. You've read the biography of Dietrich Bonhoeffer and can't remember why you knew that was something you really needed to read. If you've ever wondered what the minister is wearing under his or her robe, if you've ever been a part of a clergy team serving communion before you were ordained, if you know what a pastor's face is, if you've included a classical piece of music, a dramatic reading of the Bible, an ancient chant, a worship video, and a contemporary song all in the same service, you might be a mentor of Brooke and Linda Ashfield's if you've ever stood nervously tall in the meeting of colleagues and spoken from your heart if you've worn dangly earrings and preached in a pulpit, if you've preached with a child wrapped around your leg, if you've walked in a pride parade, if you floated in a pool on an inner tube drinking a beer and remembering them fondly, if you've ever asked the question, uh, but I'm pregnant, can I do that while I'm pregnant? <laughs> If ever after sharing quiet wisdom or some bold and courageous encouragement to another human being, now that nugget of wisdom I learned from Brooke and Linda, you say, you might have been a mentee of Brooke or Linda's or both. The Spirit has come on her way through you. She came to me 
and I am thankful her, for her presence as she carries your nuggets of wisdom with mine now through to everyone I meet. Peace, my friends, as you begin this next season. Good morning, everyone. For those of you that uh, don't remember me or don't know me, my name is Mike Burns. I am currently a minister in the Presbyterian Church of Canada at uh, Burns Mosa Presbyterian Church near Glencoe, Ontario. But I will always consider Knox Waterloo, my home congregation, and Brook and Linda my ministers. Before entering ministry from Knox, I taught senior high there for a few years. I was chair of the pastoral care committee or a member of it for many years, a member of the long range planning committee that started the process which led to your beautiful new building. And I was also a ruling elder on session. First of all, I would like to say that it is an honor and a privilege to be asked to contribute to the retirement service for Brooke and Linda Ashfield. Brooke and Linda and the congregation of Knox Waterloo have had a tremendous influence on who Debbie and I have become and what we have done with our lives as we have listened more closely to God's call. As a minister, I have learned that congregations and ministers play an equal role in shaping each other and shaping and polishing each other. So the accolades that are being paid to Brooke and Linda this morning are also accolades to you as a congregation. Having three ministers come from Knox Waterloo during the tenure of Brooke and Linda speaks volumes to your empowering leadership and your focus on God's call upon all of our lives to build, God, to build God's kingdom in our own way. Shelley, Reuben, and myself are perhaps the most visible in a churchy sense, but I think of so many people who have grown in faith and began sharing their God-given gifts to participate in kingdom work at Knox Waterloo. Debbie and I started attending Knox in September of 1997 when Linda was leading a study group on living faith. We were searching for more meaning in our lives and an opportunity to wrestle with some of those big questions of life. Linda encouraged our questions and it seemed that every few years they found Debbie and I in their offices asking more questions. And I can remember in the early 2000s asking Linda about learning more about how do we discover or discern our own gifts. I think what I was hoping for was that Linda would then lead some type of study in the church, but instead she got up from her chair and she went to her bookshelf behind her desk and she searched through it and she found this study guide on gifts and calling. And she handed it to us and suggested that we lead our own group. Four of us gathered over a couple of months and this self-led study had such a profound impact on the four of us that a couple of years later we were asked to lead that study again and had over 20 per people participate in the second, uh, rather the second time around. I believe that the greatest thing that we learned from Brooke, Linda and the many faithful people of Knox Waterloo was to not only trust God but to trust that God would speak and lead and influence us through all of the people with whom we shared our faith journey. Reading from Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus, chapter 4, verses 11 to 16. The gifts he gave that, were, that some were to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. We must no longer be children tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness and deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knitted together by every ligament with which it is equipped, 
as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth and building itself up in love. Brooke and Linda, you may be retiring, but you will still be ministering in new ways. And Knox Waterloo will continue their ministry to each other and to their new ministers as together we grow in faith. As we begin, let me say how great it is to be here today and, and how wonderful to have been invited to share, finally, after the delays, finally in this day together. We're doing ours together, so Tori, do you remember when we met Brooke and Linda? I do. It was in 1982. Linda was the guest speaker at a PYPS spring weekend, and we were the chaperones at that same weekend. They were just about to move from Chatsworth and Dornut Church and from the Owen Sound Church to Toronto to start at Gateway Presbyterian Church. This wasn't the only youth event we saw them at. In 1986, I remember 6,000 youth at Presbyterian Youth Triennium singing a lullaby to baby Laura when she was only a week or so old and to Brooke and Linda on the stage. One of the memories of their ministry that is the most profound is their willingness to invest in the lives of others, not just youth, but children and adults and older adults through all and each of these many years. John, you also lived with them, didn't you? Why, yes, I did. For two months before Tori and I got married in November of 86, we, I, I lived with them as I was beginning at Knox College. One day, the window guy was there measuring in the living room. He was working away and, and Brooke came down and, and had breakfast and kissed Linda and went off to the church. Well, about half an hour later, I came down, had breakfast, kissed Linda, and went off to seminary. The poor guy didn't know what to do. I mention this memory partly because you never know what's going to happen with Brooke and Linda. It's always going to be quirky. But more to the point, then and now, their door was always open. Often, literally, they don't always lock it. Over the years, my brother, my son, my daughter have all stayed there, and many, many others, knowing that the door is open, the tea is on, a bed is available. And what about Chatsworth, Tori? I'm not going to lie. It was a little strange moving into the Chatsworth and Doorknock manse that Brooke and Linda had lived in not too many years before us. They knew the area and the house so much better than we did. My clearest memory was the day we needed friends and family close. They were there the very next day to be with us, to pray with us, to care for us, just the way we needed to be cared for that day. And then they came to Waterloo in 1989, didn't they, John? Yes, they did. And the best part about their coming to Knox Waterloo was that they came six months before we moved to Shadoak Church in Hamilton, which meant that, that everything happened to them six months before it happened to us. <laughs> and so they were willing to, to share that experience. And I, I have to say that over many years, I had many cigars in the backyard with Brooke and benefited from wisdom and benefited from experience. It's wisdom and experience that I share in my work today. About a week and a half ago, I was chatting with a colleague and I realized halfway through the conversation that I was quoting something that Brooke had told me literally 20 years ago, something that that person needed to hear now. Well, Tori, what about Logos? Well, that all started because of a last-minute cancellation here at Knox. Knox Waterloo was prepared to go off to learn about Logos and learn how to start the program, and a couple of people canceled and weren't able to go. 
Linda called us up and invited us to go to a Logos training in Albany, New York in a terrible snowstorm. Not only did Knox Waterloo start Logos and we start Logos at Shadok, but Logos has been started at every church I have ever served in since. It is a simple invitation and a gift that Logos has spread because of Brooke and Linda's passion for it and participation in it. The book of Colossians begins with this commendation. In our prayers for you, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. For we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. You have heard of this hope before in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you, just as it is bearing fruit and growing in the whole world, so it has been bearing fruit among yourselves from the day you heard it and truly comprehended the grace of God. Logos says, you are a child of God and I will treat you that way. And that we seek people who love God, love children and youth and adults, and have a gift to share. Thank, Thank you, you, Brooke, Brooke and Linda, Linda for, for fulfilling, fulfilling these things and blessings on your retirement. retirement. Well, well done, done good, good and faithful, faithful servants. servants. Thank you to all of you for participating today. Uh, I'm privileged to count myself among those who, uh, who have been mentored by Brooke and Linda. The Spirit has come through you to me every single day over this past year. And my life is richer for it. I like to think I'm a little bit wiser for it. I invite you to keep attempting to instill some of that wisdom and experience in me because our story will go on, I know. We're, we're going to continue to be in each other's lives. And in that beautiful way of the Spirit, it's going to continue to flow through us to touch the lives of others, to flow through them to touch the lives of others. That story is ongoing. I'm very grateful for your friendship, for your wisdom, for, uh, for the gifts that you have given to me and to this whole community. Peace, deep peace be with you both.
Let us unite our hearts together before the Lord. Let us pray. Gracious Lord and Savior, we give you thanks for mercy without measure, for comfort when we are lonely, for strength when we are weak, for courage when our hearts are faint. We praise you and we bless you that like the Israelites, you hem us in. You are before us and behind us. You know where we have been, and more importantly, you know where we are going. You love us, and you desire the very best for us. And through all of the history of your people, when there have been times of transition, you have been there. When we stood on the shore of the Red Sea, you parted the waters and led us safely through. When we stood at the base of Mount Sinai, uncertain of where to go, you gave us your law and your commands. When we waited at the edge of Jordan, you had us erect an altar to remember, and as we waited in the upper room, you granted your spirit to lead and to guide. Today we stand at our own Jordan River, giving thanks for what was and looking forward to what will come. We thank you and we praise you for these many, many years of Brooke and Linda's ministry. We thank you for their coming to us and caring for us. We bless you for the opportunities to care for them and for the witness that we have built together. We thank you for the good times, and even more so for the harder times, times when we needed an extra measure of your presence. We could not have come this far without you, and for your love and for your guidance, we are profoundly grateful. And now, O oh Lord, we stand again on the verge of the Jordan. We give you thanks that, like Moses and Miriam, Brooke and Linda have brought us safely thus far. Bless them and care for them in this season of retirement. As we cross the Jordan, as we come further into your promised land, we see Joshua. We see Hugh and Courtney guiding us into the next chapter of this community's life. We pray for them and their ministry. We pray that you would grant them courage and joy. We pray that we might all grow in love and delight in each other and in our community and in you. We pray that all that has brought us here might be the solid foundation upon which we build the next exciting chapter in the life of this community. Guide this community of faith, O oh Lord, we pray. Keep them safely, especially in this pandemic season. Open our eyes and our hearts to the needs of the community around us and grant us the means to meet those needs so that we might see the good works and praise you, our Lord in heaven. Finally, our Lord, in the love of your Son and the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray for those who have special need of you this day, for those who are separated from loved ones, for those who are sick and grieving. We pray especially for the Vi family and Thornhill Presbyterian Church in the death this week of Tom Vi. We pray for first responders and teachers and all who are at the forefront of this pandemic. Guide them and keep them safe until the day that we can hold one another and be together again. This we pray in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Before we enjoy our, our closing hymn, I'd like to let you know that following the benediction and the, and the choral closing, there will be a five-minute intermission, during which time we'll set up for the continuation of the celebration today. Uh, during that break, if you want to stand up in, in your place and stretch, feel free to do so. And if you are, have to use the washroom, then we kindly ask that you, you stay safe distance from, from those around you. Thank you. That'll be a five-minute break. 
Be thou my vision, number 461. Let's stand and enjoy this song together. beautiful day and the celebration, may we be reminded continually that the God who made us, that the Christ who mends us, that the Spirit who molds us and passes through us to touch the lives of others goes with us every step of the way. Thanks be to God for this amazing grace, this amazing gift. Amen. <laughs> 